because I thought it might be better if we organize the program around discrete topics and discrete proposals for both the regulations and the statutes and invite people uh, that know something about particular things and it won't be the same people for every item uh, to contribute. And I might ask someone to start a discussion and may maybe ask someone else to jump in and then, and then open it up for a bit back and forth. The goal is to get through everything on the agenda. Now, um, there's a copy of the agenda here on our, on our, on our website, if, if people haven't, I think everyone's seen it, but just, just so they know kind of the order of which we're, we're planning on, on doing things. I wanted to start with the regulations first, because those are the things that will go into effect unless they're stopped. I mean, those are, those are things that are pretty far along in the process. The legislative proposals, also important, people will have an opportunity in committee hearings and markups and things like that through lobbying efforts to the legislature or the Congress to influence those. So those will be second. I mean, they're both important, but we're going to start with the regulations for the Bayh-Dole Act and then later do the uh, Stevenson-Weidler uh, statute uh, proposals. Before we get started, I'd just like to go around um, and ask people uh, to, to introduce themselves. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I, 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 I'm, um, I'm not sure if everyone's looking at the same screen I am in terms of who's on and who's not on, but uh, uh, perhaps Robert, you could start. Uh, Robert Cook Deegan. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm Bob Cook Deegan. I'm a professor at Arizona State University. Um, I used to work at the Office of Technology Assessment, which is how I got into tech transfer um, in the mid 80s as Baidol was being implemented. And we've been following it for some time, particularly relating to gene patents, the effect in diagnostics, the Myriad case, the Mayo case. And um, so we've been expecting this for some time, although I didn't expect it to look as bad as it does coming out of NIST. Uh, Alan, Alan, um, Alan Black. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, Alan Black, I'm a, a, a patent attorney by trade. Uh, I. Uh, my background is in immunology and vaccine development, uh, but I went back to law school and uh, I currently teach biotechnology law at the University of Pittsburgh. <sighs> I got involved in the uh, really the Bidel Act for, from calling Jamie. Jamie was the first person really to attempt March in. My clients received a drug called Fabrizyme, which uh, is probably one of the most, ex not now, but it used to be one of the most expensive drugs in the world. Uh, the first thing we did, uh, my clients asked me, you know, is there anything we can do? Uh, Genzyme manufactured the drug, botched it, and could only make uh, not even half doses for people in the United States. And uh, what we wanted was basically a margin uh, license or at least to get somebody a march in license to make the drug. Uh, for for Bray disease is uniformly lethal, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, people who are receiving the half dose of the drug were understandably uh, getting sicker, some died. And uh, it turned out it was quite a, uh, I don't know, dystopian journey to try and uh, get National Institutes of Health to get involved in marching. Alan, Alan I, I, I just, because I want to get through a lot, a lot of introductions. I, 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 I'm sorry, I'll cut it off. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Take but, care. But, but Alan is, Alan was a lawyer for uh, the Barbizine marching, marching request, and as he mentioned, uh, an academic and a patent lawyer. John Wilkinson? If John's not available, Susan Rucker. Give people a time to uh, unmute themselves. Yeah, and just as a note, you're automatically muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself when you want to speak. Hi, I'm Susan Rucker. I work for the NIH in the tech transfer um, office at NCI, and I've been there for, well, not at NCI, but at the NIH for what, 30 years? A long time, since 1991. So I'm just 
kind of on the call to listen to see what people have to say. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Fred? Thanks, Amy. Um, Fred Reinhardt, I work part-time for UMass Amherst. I'm a past president of Autumn. And I guess, Jamie, you can consider me the loyal opposition as usual. Uh, I think that March and I think it's a waste of time. I think it's not allowed by uh, for pricing, not uh, permitted by statute. And it, it has so many flaws in it. it in my opinion, it would never uh, it will never happen, and I think you'd be better off uh, putting your efforts in another with other strat strategies. Thank you, uh, Kat. Kat Clary. Everybody, okay, uh, what? I'm sorry, uh, uh, Kat. Kat Clary first. I should have mentioned both names. I'm sorry. No problem, uh, Kat Clary. I'm a data analyst at the Center for Integration of Science and Industry at Bentley University and the lead author of the study that quantified the NIH contribution towards all of the drugs approved by the FDA in the last decade. And I am here to learn about the policy implications. Uh, thank you. Uh, whoever's on the phone for 202-676-6023. You know how to you know, mute yourself and your phone. It could be a problem. We, we can come back to you when you're when when that's comfortable. Robert uh, Robert Sachs. Hi, I'm I'm Robert Sachs. Um, I'm new to this group. I don't know if this group meets regularly or not, but I'm it's my <clears throat> first participation. Um, I'm uh, just by background. I'm an attorney, though retired now. I'm a past chair of the uh, board of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. I currently serve on the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute board. I think more relevant to our conversation today, I have advanced prostate cancer. I was first diagnosed uh, five and a half years ago, went through radiation and surgery and um, androgen deprivation therapy after a few years. None of that worked. Uh, it spread to my skeletal structure. Um, and I'm currently taking a drug, um, enzalutamide, uh, which is marketed under the name of Extandi. Um, it sells for $150,000 a year. Um, fortunately, I have uh, Medicare Part D, oh, fortunately for me, I suppose. So my copay is only about $10,000 a year, which I can afford, but um, the, the, the rest of that cost is being borne by our healthcare system. Uh, I'll probably participate a little bit later, but let me, since this is introductions, let me stop there. Thank you, Robert. Patricia Kelmar. Hi there, I'm the US PERG uh, Public Interest Research Group Healthcare Campaigns Director, and um, my portfolio includes uh, dealing with the high prices of prescription drugs, so I'm here to learn more. Thanks. Thank you. Nina, uh, Sir, Sir, how do I say it? It's difficult. Sreo Beach. <laughs> Just don't look at it. Um, hi. I. Um, about a year ago, I switched from doing patent litigation in private practice to academia. And now I am the clinical teaching fellow at Georgetown's Intellectual Property and Information Policy Clinic. Thank you, uh, Marissa. Hi, this is Marissa Barrera. Um, I handle healthcare for Senator Bernie Sanders on the budget committee. I've been there for about five years and mostly just here to listen and learn from you all. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Theroux. Hi, Jamie. Um, my name is Theroux Balasubramaniam. I'm Geneva representative of uh, Knowledge Ecology International, and I work with Jamie and many of our colleagues who are uh, gonna be speaking today. And uh, we back 
in Geneva, especially um, issues related to access to medicines, innovation, intellectual property institutions such as uh, WHO, WIPO, and WTO. Uh, Kathy Hurwitz. Thanks, Jamie. Um, Kathy Hurwitz, I come from a Hill background where I used uh, Janie's expertise a lot. Over the years, I worked for what most recently 20 years for Jan Schakowsky, who serves on the Energy and Commerce Committee. I'm now working with the Lower Drug Prices Now campaign, and we're interested in how we can engage people around the country in fighting um, for lower drug prices by protecting these rights. Thank you, Rachel Cohen. Everyone, good to see you. Um, I'm Rachel Cohen. I'm the Regional Executive Director of the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, DNDI, which is a not-for-profit research and development group that develops drugs for a variety of neglected populations. Um, don't follow this as closely as I used to in previous um, iterations. Um, so I just wanted to get kind of a lay of the land, Jamie. So thank you to you and KEI for organizing this. Rachel, are you in um, Geneva? No, I am presently in New Jersey, technically. Um, Julia Santos. Hey, everyone. This is Julia Santos. I'm with Indivisible. I do healthcare policy, um, and I'm also here just to learn from you all. Stephen uh, Knievel, also related to Evil Knievel. <laughs> Extraordinarily distantly. Um, yeah, I, I'm Steve Knievel. I work with Public Citizen in our Access to Medicines program, so I focus a lot on these issues. Manuel? I know uh, uh, we'll come back later. Ruth Loper. Hi, everyone. I'm Ruth Loper. I'm not using my video because I'm in a hotel with poor Wi Fi. Um, I'm a public health physician who has had a long-standing interest in issues around um, medicines pricing, access, IP, uh, trade, etc. I used to work in the Australian Department of Health as the Director of Pharmaceutical Policy. I'm currently working at the OECD as the lead on pharmaceuticals and medical devices, but I'm joining you today in my personal capacity, not as a representative of OECD. I just have to make that abundantly clear. I'm interested in the implications of these changes and um, I'm here to learn rather than contribute very much, I don't think, but thank you. Thank you, Moga. Dr. Moga. Right. Hi, I'm Moga Kamaliani. Um, I am currently a consultant to UNAIDS and to the People's Vaccine Coalition on um, access to COVID products, um, especially the vaccines, but I have like a million years <laughs> working on access to medicine, access to healthcare, from practicing medicine actually in, in rural and urban areas to research, to advocacy, campaigning, to research, everything. <laughs> And I'm here, actually, I we, I don't think we have, well, we don't have this kind of uh, marching in, in the UK. We have, where I'm based, we have something else, but um, um, I just can't see them changing. So I'm here also to learn and thank you for organizing it. So maybe we can learn something that we can push the UK to do something useful. Thank you. Uh, I have someone called uh, Lisa's phone. Lisa's iPhone? Yeah, sorry, I'm calling from the phone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's a, I'm a professor at Emory and I had about 10 years of practice in tech transfer. Um, and then I now focus on the regulation of researching the regulation of biomedical markets from an access perspective. Uh, Peter? This is Peter, hi. I'm. Uh... I'm, our, I'm the Access Medicines Director of Public Citizen. I work with Steve, who will be presenting today. I don't know if there's a different part of the queue. Sorry, I just uh, joined. That's great. And, and I will just uh, briefly say that uh, Claire Cassidy, Louise Gill Abinator, Catherine Arzon, and Menno Ress from KER are also part of the call. And uh, 
I, I think we'll we'll start right now because uh, um, we have such a full agenda. As I mentioned uh, earlier, um, uh, uh, the more we look at the, uh, the the number of issues that are involved in the proposed regulations and the proposed statutory uh, changes, we decided to have an agenda where we go issue by issue, starting with the regulations to the Bayh-Dole Act, which have been proposed. They were noticed on the 4th of January, uh, a day before the uh, primary in, uh, in Georgia. A lot of people probably uh, may have missed them at the time. It was right after the New Year's. Uh, the comment period closes on the 5th of, um, uh, the 5th of, of April. There's gonna be a, 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 a seminar that, that NIST is gonna hold on these issues as well. And I think NIST has agreed to have a follow-up uh, conversation about it with, uh, that they would participate in, although they were they declined to participate today. Uh, there, I think there's some anxiety uh, with the transition going on about what can be said on behalf of a proposal that was made under the Trump administration, but will have to be implemented by the uh, Biden administration, just trying to figure out what the new policies are by people. Uh, I think for us, this is a, a uh, a, a pretty interesting issue because it will be an early indicator of if, if there's differences of policy between the Trump administration and the Biden administration on specifics that have to do with uh, intellectual property rights and drugs. Um, we're going to, uh, 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 if people have, I, I think I've shared in the chat uh, the, the agenda, I think people have received it by email. And as I noted, the, the idea was to start with the proposed regulations, and we wanted to identify, we wanted to work with uh, uh, four issues in the proposed regulations. There's more things that are being done in the regulations, but we've identified four things that we wanted to start with. And I was going to sort of go with uh, uh, point by point to these first four and invite people to speak on them. Uh, the first issue uh, we wanted to start with on the regulations was was the uh, proposal to restrict the grounds for margin rights as regard the pricing of the products. Uh, specifically, uh, in the, uh, you know, you can, you can go to the Federal Register Notice if you want to sort of see the specific, uh, and I'm gonna just put a link here to the, the regulations itself. If you wanna look at the exact language that's being proposed, What's at stake is a modification of 37 CFR 401.6 that uh, addresses uh, uh, marching rights. Marching for people, I think this is a pretty sophisticated audience, is when the government has rights in a subject convention, uh, members of the public can petition the government to force uh, a license to one or more uh, third parties. There, there, in order to do that, there are certain grounds that you have to establish. You don't have an absolute right to do it, and the agency does have an absolute right to refuse all marching requests. In order to qualify for marching requests, you have to establish that there's been some abuse of the patent right or some public interest that's served by the thing. And the owner of the patent has remedies, uh, procedural remedies, in order to uh, avoid the marching request from being granted. I think most people are aware this is not a very widely used feature of the system. It's probably being uh, used a little bit more than people think it is. But I think uh, um, what's important to us is in the regulation, one of the key things that's being proposed is that they eliminate the uh, pricing, uh, uh, the price of the product as a sole condition for a margin request. To put it into perspective, there is a pending margin, margin request to the Department of Defense for uh, the drug market, the prostate drug market as uh, Xandi. And the basis of that margin request is that the price in the United States, which is roughly in the neighborhood of $150,000 a year, is, is somewhere between three and five times more expensive than it is in any other country of a similar income. And, uh, uh, and so that's an example of a case where, uh, where uh, the, 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 the current grounds is that uh, the, the pricing would be a deal. What's, a, what's, what, what's important in this particular case is the statute itself that the marching uh, uh, rules are based upon, which the regulations are supposed to interpret, says that there's an obligation on the patent holder to make a product available to the public on reasonable terms. So this last phrase, available 
to the public on reasonable terms are what's being argued about. And I think Fred has one interpretation. We have another interpretation of what that means. What the regulation would do is it doesn't say that you can't bring up the price in a margin request. They're saying that you can't bring up the price as the only thing. Like, for example, uh, you, you might be able to connect it to some other issue, such as the public health grounds or something like that. But it's, it's perceived by us and other people as a way of, of taking off the table the idea that an excessive price is a grounds for a margin request. Now, uh, Robert Sachs is here. I think he has drafted recently a, an article which hasn't been published yet, but you're, 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 he's taken interest in this issue because he is a patient that takes Extandi, the one that's subject to a current open margin request. And I, I invited uh, Robert to share his thoughts on this issue. Um, thanks, Jamie. Um, and I know more about Extandi than I, I do about marching rights, but let me share with you what I know and I'll give you some flavor for it. Um, it's, a, it's a drug that has, you know, through several clinical trials been demonstrated to extend the lives of uh, patients with advanced prostate cancer. It's, it's a very good uh, drug, better than anything else that um, exists today. Uh, its history is interesting. And, and when I um, needed some further treatment last September, um, it was really when I focused on it. I knew, and it it, during its development, it went by the name enzalutamide. So I may go back and forth between the two. Um, but as I learned more about it, I felt the pricing of it was truly unconscionable, um, not just unreasonable, unconscionable. Um, the drug was funded um, by NIH and DOD uh, in the early 2000s, there were a couple of researchers at UCLA who were working, working on this. And UCLA, um, in turn, licensed a company uh, in Northern California, and UCLA realized uh, more than half a billion dollars, which I, I don't really take issue with which they have put back into research. And um, that company in Northern California in turn uh, sold a 50% interest for international um, distribution rights uh, to Astellas, a Japanese company uh, for $765 million. Uh, retaining the other 50% interest. Then after FDA, uh, further approvals from FDA, which came in 2012, that small biotech in Northern California was acquired by Pfizer for $14 billion. Um, no doubt they have other intellectual property, but this was the cash cow. So um, as Jamie said, it's being sold in the US for anywhere from three to five times more than any, any other developed country or advanced economy. In Japan, where Astellas, which still holds a 50% interest, is headquartered, uh, the price is one fifth that it is in the US. Um, and, and even that is not an insignificant price at about 30, the equivalent of about $30,000 a year. Um, but here, um, it's, it's currently at, uh, you take four, four capsules a day. The, that's the standard dose. Standard period, at least initially, is about a year. I'm four or five months into it now. Uh, that's over $400 a day. Um, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I 
I'm a, I have you know Medicare and Medicare Part D. Um, if you were um, younger, there may be insurance issues. If you're poor, you may have insurance issues. You likely would. Um, and it's so it, it's, it's certainly on price alone by any definition. I think it would be deemed unreasonable. Um, and, 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 you know, the pharma argument typically is, you know, the high cost of, of drug development. And there is a high cost of drug development. But when in this case, the holders of the patent rights today, um, Astellas and Pfizer played a, a relatively insignificant role in the development of this drug it was the UCLA researchers who had the most to do with it. And with each successive uh, sale uh, of those rights, uh, it added to the cost of it. And today that's being borne by consumers. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, uh, that I think is, is a very good introduction. Steve, uh, I know that this is an area that public citizen is focused on in the regulations. Uh, did, did you want to make some comments on the proposal and the regulations. Yeah, sure. I, I hadn't prepared specific comments on this piece, but, you know, I, that uh, Public Citizen has, you know, worked closely with, with KEI over the last several years, as well as um, universities allied for essential medicines, specifically on trying to uh, make use of public interest rights on, on Xtandi. Um, and, you know, I, I think it, one thing that is attractive to us about this case is that, um, you know, I think one of the concerns that many have about, about using by dual rights is that not all of the patents will have government rights disclosed on them. In the Xtandi case, um, all the patents do disclose government interests. So we think it's, it's a very, you know, the government's on very solid grounds there. Um, and it'd be, you know, relatively less burdensome. Um, but it just goes to, you know, I, I don't think I have much to add beyond um, you know, Robert's great presentation, what Jamie said earlier, but, you know, we think that it would be a huge mistake for the government to, to, um, to roll back its rights in this way and, and inconsistent with the statute, as Jamie said earlier. So, so I, I put the, uh, I put in the chat, the, uh, the proposal, um, the proposed uh, regulation to add this new uh, section E. It says, um, um, for people on the telephone, it says, margin rights shall not be exercised exclusively based on the business decisions of the contractor regarding the pricing of commercial goods and services arising from the practical application of mention. Now, I know that Fred, um, uh, who represents uh, and has represented as the president of Autumn uh, Universities, basically, uh, that involved in licensing these technologies, uh, I think you have a contrary view to our view, and I want to give you an opportunity to share it. Sure. Well, first of all, um, and this is not developed by NIH and DOD. It was developed by um, UCLA. All three of the patents in the Orange Book are owned by UCLA. Okay. The total amount of federal money that went to UCLA was far less than five million, and then. If you compare that to the amount of investment made by the companies, uh, it's probably up. I think Ashley Stevens, who you know, Jamie, uh, has estimated that it's over 900 million. So to say that this was developed by with government at solely at government expense is simply not true. Fred, Fred can I just? Can I just? just on this one point, because this comes up a lot, the university uh, sometimes will get money in the preclinical phase or in the early clinical phase when the risks are quite high. And, and sometimes the companies will come in, particularly toward the clinical and, and particularly the advanced clinical trials, which are expensive, but not as risky as the early parts. In Joe Damasi's study of drug development cost, he had assigned a, uh, uh, over $1 billion as the economic value of the preclinical research. So if the government had funded $5 million 
in preclinical research, and I forget the exact number on Exandi, that wasn't the only $5 million grant the US government gave. The US government gave a very large number of grants, and not all of them paid off in terms of drugs. So when Pfizer makes an investment, people always say, but what about the, uh, the dry holes? What about the ones that failed? But when the federal government makes investments, sometimes people don't look at the ones that failed that the government funded. So if you, if you do apples and apples, if you do uh, use Demasi's methodology, you would, you would assign the public investment and the preclinical at over a billion dollars on this product. Well, I've heard that argument before, but the, the federal government invests 40 billion a year in academic research. And, but that is, that is spread all over the place. They didn't invest a huge amount in, in developing Xtandi. But I, I, I know you make that argument. Well, no, I, it's not just me, it's Demasi as well. I mean, if, okay. if, if, if Pfizer was to make an investment of, 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 of 5 million or 10 million in a product, in the preclinical phase, would he would, would, would Demasi count that as a five or ten million dollar investment, or would he count that as a billion dollar investment? Mm -hmm. I think you know the answer. Demasi is counting those as a billion dollar investment because he, he he looks at the out of pocket cost, he adds uh, the opportunity cost of capital, uh, he, he adjusts for risk, and he takes a small investment and he makes it in a fairly large number because he recognizes that most preclinical investments don't succeed. So I, I think what's happened in, in the case of the Army investment and the NIH investment and is both agencies really invested in Xtandi at UCLA, not to mention the state legislature and funding UCLA, UCLA, UCLA itself. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think it's, it's, it's probably not a good idea to minimize the economic value of the government's investment. In any case, the government does have the rights. It does have the rights, as you acknowledge, in all of the patents related well, to the government that you mentioned. They have rights for government use, but that has the never been. They also have the margin rights and these patents. For, I mean, for, for the, the, the three or four categories that I, I agree are totally appropriate, but not pricing. And you would say available to the public on a reasonable terms means what? Available through licensing. But does it say licensing? No, but I mean, here, here's what we're debating about for the last 20 years. And, and I mean, even Birch Bayh and Robert Dole never agreed and they came out in, in, in public statements and said, this was not for pricing controls. But that was after both of them represented drug companies after leaving the Senate. Okay. So, so, so Jamie, on this point, um, yeah. As a, as a suggestion for KEI, if the purpose of this is you're thinking through what, whether and, and how you're going to weigh in here, I actually think that this regulatory provision goes well beyond the statute. It was debated when by Dole was debated, Admiral Rick, however, raised it. Arno and Davis raised this in their law review article, and then by and Dole responded to that. And frankly, this is an issue that should be considered by Congress. Um, I think the point to make in commenting on the regulations is they have decided to interpret the statute to say that pricing should not be the exclusive criterion. I think the congressional record is not clear on that and legal scholars disagree about that. And I think that should be for Congress to decide, not for a regulatory agency to decide. Is this, is this Robert speaking right now? Yeah, it's Bob Cook Deegan, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think it is aggressive to, 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 to uh, shut this off by regulation. Uh, John Thomas, uh, Jay Thomas, who's a professor at Georgetown who advises the office of uh, 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 the you know, various government, uh, CRS and other federal agencies. He's been quoted in the Washington Post as saying it's uh, quite obviously that available to the public on reasonable terms would include the price. But, uh, to the extent that it's 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 it's, it's as 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 Professor uh, Cook Deegan mentions, to the extent that there's a controversy over it, <clears throat> this seems to uh, resolve the controversy in a way quite favorably to Pfizer and to uh, AstraZeneca and companies that are charging Americans more for cancer drugs in the United States than they do uh, abroad. And I mean, as Robert mentioned, 
Xtandi is $30,000 in Japan, marketed by Estellas, which is a senior partner in the licensing agreement, a Japanese company, and $150,000 a year in the United States. So by changing the regulation, it would foreclose the opportunity to have Americans pay no more than foreign countries pay for a drug to which the US government had funded the preclinical research on and early clinical trials as well. Uh, do, do other people want to weigh in on this particular thing? Because we have, and I apologize for such a full agenda, but we, we want to, uh, uh, our, next, our next topic is uh, uh, the question of how the regulations define a subject invention. And if it's okay, we, we can come back to some of these things. If we can sort of move on to that. I, I think there, Luis, you wanted to begin with a, an, a, an explanation of what's going on and the modification of C, uh, 37 CFR 401.14. Sure. Uh, so the definition of subject invention, which is located at, at, at CFR 401.14, as Jeremy mentioned, is very important because it determines what are the inventions that are subject to the Bible provisions. If, it, if a particular invention falls within this definition, then things like marching rights, but also government free uses, disclosure requirements, and everything else applies. If an invention falls outside of this definition, then none of those things apply. So currently, the subject, the regulations define subject invention as an invention that is made in the performance of work under a government contract. Um, but the, um, the proposed regulation wants to change this definition by adding a last sentence, I'm gonna read it in full, that says an invention that is conceived and reduced to practice without the use of any federal funds is not considered a subject invention. So um, in addition to being within the scope of the work that was agreed in the government contract, it has to be paid by the federal funds. And uh, I believe there are two main consequences of that sentence that they want to uh, add to this definition. The one obvious consequence, I guess, is that um, a path or inventions that are not funded by the, with the federal funds and yet done in the performance of work will no longer be subject to the Bible provisions. It's- um, Luis, Luis, can I, can I just, just, just interrupt? Yep. What you're saying is the proposal regulation would be a narrowing of, 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 the, uh, uh, of the rights the government would have of work performed under the performance it, of the contract when there's mixed funding involved. It will no longer, so if, 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 if an invention was only f not funded by the federal funds, then sub the, the invention will not be subject to the vital at all because it will not be a subject invention. But let me just let me yeah let me just sort of put it a different way for people. Suppose that there's a case where there's a, go a government funding agreement. The government funding agreement is less than 100 percent of the total amount, but it's part of the deal. As long as the government is funding part of the work, all the work that's currently considered under the contract conveys to the government rights in the in the patent. Those becomes so-called subject conventions. Under this proposal, you'd have to have an accounting of whether the, 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 the government money or the Pfizer money or whomever was used for this particular activity. And it would really create an incentive for the, for the companies that were claiming patents to always claim that no, even though it's in the performance of, of the work on, on the funding agreement, there was some non-federal funding which actually um, uh, you know, was, 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 you know, the part that funded the thing that, that led to the invention. So the practical effect would be a narrowing. What we don't really know is how severe the narrowing would be, but it's designed to alienate from the taxpayers rights that they have under the current regulations. Do people have questions about this or comments? Is this something, uh, Fred, that uh, Autumnus and weighed in on in the past? Is no, that why although I, you know, I think when you have a, an invention made at a university and then there's a handoff to a company, there's a nice separation there that, that would help that, yeah, I mean, a company could cheat that way, but um, 
you know, the flip side of that is <laughs> you're gonna, it sounds like you, the other abuse would be reaching in to claim government rights to huge amounts of investment of time and money that, you know, over the next five or six years, long after the federal grant is over. Well, actually, is that, is that, that, that hasn't happened. That there's no evidence that that is, in fact, a problem. In fact, isn't underreporting the bigger problem of government rights? I mean, right now we have, we have a half dozen petitions to the NIH, maybe more, of cases where universities, for example, have not reported government, grant, uh, government funding of inventions where they clearly had a grant to do exactly what the patent was about. We haven't found any cases where there's been overreporting of the government interest in the past. No, I, and I think you've performed a valuable service in that, Jamie. I mean, really, universities need to do their federal reporting. And if not, there's recourse. And you're absolutely right to point it out. OK, so so I guess we can then move on to the, um, uh, the next regulation, which is a, a change on the standing for who can appeal uh, a decision by a federally owned, by uh, for this, this, the next one is, is, is a modification of a 37 CFR 404-11. And what this has to do is patents are owned by the federal government. So this would not include a patent that was owned by Yale University or UCLA. It would have to do with a patent that was owned by the NIH or DARPA or BARDA or someone like that. And in those cases, the government has the option under uh, under, under federal law to go either exclusive or non-exclusive. And when, when the license is exclusive, it's federally owned. Now, if it's a university going exclusive, the university has complete discretion about going exclusive or non-exclusive, but the federal government is treated differently. They can only go exclusive in certain cases. And uh, right now, uh, anyone that's injured by the decision to go exclusive has the right to appeal that decision. It's not easy to get standing. We, we for example, uh, have uh, um, uh, lost the case because uh, we couldn't prove that we were harmed by a licensing decision in the one, one case where we, 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 uh, we, we tried to litigate uh, on a Gilead uh, license. But nonetheless, there still is uh, room to establish that as a consumer or as a patient or some other group, you might be able to claim that you have standing to appeal administratively as well as um, uh, uh, in court. But this regulation would uh, limit it to, um, uh, 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 to, to people trying to commercialize the invention, like basically competitors. Uh, Catherine, I think you've looked at this. You want to add something to, to this conversation? I think that you covered that really well. Um, I would just add that there are three grounds for appealing a license decision. And Section 209E of the Bayer Dole Act gives the public a role in all license decisions. And that's really important because the license, the public funds these government patents, owns these government patents, and may be negatively affected by these government patents because they create a monopoly. And when we've commented on the exclusive patent license, they've tended to maximize the scope of the monopoly in every possible way. So that can lead to higher prices for a longer period of time and restricted access. And the third ground for appealing, the ground that um, NIST wants to change, just requires you to show that you uh, timely submitted comments under 209E and that you would be damaged. Um, and so that seems to encompass the public role in challenging these licensing decisions. But now um, what NIST wants to do is say that you have to have the opportunity and lose the opportunity to commercialize the invention. So it's like it's trying to take out the public role because normally consumer groups, patient groups, people who have cancer or other conditions that might be affected by the license would be able to show damage, um, damages and appeal, but no longer if this regulation is enacted. Does anybody have any questions about? Uh, yeah, or, so, or so again, this is Bob Cook Deegan. I do have a question about this. Is this a modification of Stevenson Weidler or of? The Bayh-Dole regulations. By regulations. This, the, yeah, everything right now so far is, is Bayh-Dole regulations. Okay, so if this is under Bayh-Dole, this is utterly antithetical to the spirit of the statute and actually the letter of the statute. There's only one place in the Bayh-Dole statute that mentions commercialization. And where it mentions it, it puts it commercialization and public availability. That's in the prologue. 
And so by restricting sanding, this, this is what the CAFC would love to do also, but the Supreme Court has clearly indicated that's not true. And if you think about the one case that was litigated all the way up to the Supreme Court, that was the Myriad case, standing in that case was the Harry Oster, who was not a competitor and was not trying to commercialize. He was trying to use in a university context, the patented invention. So this is, I think, a, a regulation that goes beyond the statute and could be easily challenged in court and they would lose. Oh, that's, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's interesting and helpful. Is any, we have, I know we have some experts in technology transfer here. Do you have, do any of the people here that work in tech transfer have any appeal, uh, any thoughts on the, on, on this particular issue, which as I say, does not, does not affect like every university or, you know, any, any, any grantee. It, it just affects cases where the U.S. government is in fact the owner of the patent and decides to go exclusive. I haven't touched, I haven't dealt with it, Jim. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I think uh, moving right along, we're going to go to uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fourth uh, commissioner, and this has to do with weakening the requirements for inventions to be considered for license and life uh, by considering licensing and license payments as a means of providing benefits to the inventions to the public. This is on uh, 37 CFR 4042 object and invention. And uh, Catherine, is this something that, that uh, you would look at? Yes, I'm prepared to speak about this one. So Jamie talked about practical application with respect to margin rights when somebody other than the government owns the invention. But practical application is also an obligation for all licensees to federal owned inventions, which can be very important. For example, um, the NIH owns a spike, spike protein patent that has been licensed to several companies, including Pfizer and Biotech for their coronavirus vaccines. So right now, the obligation for all licensees, whether exclusive or non-exclusive, is to make the invention available to the public on reasonable terms. It's to achieve practical application defined as making the invention available on reasonable terms. Um, what NIST wants to do is say that the government can negotiate a license that says that practical application is achieved whenever the licensee makes its payments to the government. So again, it wants to take a public facing requirement, which is about availability, about availability of the invention to the public and take that out of the regulations and make it an agency facing requirement. So that would completely transform the obligation and take the public interest aspect of, of it out of the um, regulation by saying that uh, licensees have satisfied their obligation whenever they're making their license payments. And also that's, that's really a shell requirement. That's not an additional requirement because licensees are already obligated to make their license payments under the licenses. So this would disincentivize companies from doing anything beyond making their payments to the government and take out the public interest aspect. I, 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 I put in the chat for people that uh, are able to see it, uh, the specific proposal uh, in terms of the regs in 14.2. It was under a section called policy objectives, uh, an objective, uh, which, which in the statute, uh, the, the statute 35 USC 200, which talks about uh, policy objective does mention the Bayh-Dole Act is, is designed to address both uh, to promote use and to avoid uh, non-use uh, of government patents. I, I, I think how I understand this is, is that this goes to the sort of a working obligation if you have a federally funded invention. You have to actually turn it into a product and then the people have to get access to the product. Under this, if, if payments are made, uh, the idea that the benefit to the public is the money they get on the payments, whether or not uh, the product is actually um, something concrete that people would use. I, I was just surprised to see this in here. Um, Fred, do you know why the, people wanted this change in the um, in the regulations? No, I, and I think we were as surprised as you were. Not not sure. Um, public citizen, have you looked at this particular issue or? Yeah, I haven't, and, and I'll just uh, save you time to say I haven't looked deeply at these regs. I've kind of dug in a little bit on the. 
the Stephen Sitton Widler. You're more the statute uh, guy today, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and, and, and Professor Deegan uh, had some point that we had overlooked in the regulations that he thought we should pay attention to. This had to do with, uh, you said the abeyance. And Robert, uh, could you, Bob, could you, could you elaborate a bit on that? It's, it's, it's yeah, so let me explain. So there's a section of the, there's a whole section of the Bayh-Dole Act that deals with the march in. And just to frame this, Fred may be right that this is a largely a waste of time because we've got section 1498 authority, which is much easier to use and much more likely to solve the problems to the degree that government's going to do something. But if you've got a provision in the statute, you better get it right. So there's a whole section on march in rights. Um, and in that section, there are four criteria for trigger, triggering the march in. Um, one of those is there's this whole section of Baidol that has to do with domestic manufacture. And you have to comply with that, that if your invention is, is licensed, it needs to be mainly manufactured in the United States, unless you get a waiver. So the march in can happen if you don't do that. And there's, uh, there are two other criteria that basically amount to the government needs to use this and it needs to be compliable, compatible with what the government, other government regulations. And then the most important one um, that uh, this abeyance was applied to was failure to work the patent, basically. Um, and um, so for the government use and the, um, the failure to work criteria, basically there's a rule that's built into the statute that says you can't go in and march, march in and grab the rights from the patent holder until all they have exhausted all of their appeals process. It's in the statute that only applies to those two criteria and does not apply to the health and safety needs criterion or to the march in criteria, the, the domestic manufacturer criterion. This regulation seems to apply it to all of those. All four. Which all four criteria. And I think that matters because I think health and safety needs is the criterion that matters for most drugs and public health uses. And I think it's pretty clear the statute did not intend it to do that. And I think again here, I think the regulation is overreaching the statute and it's gonna matter in the cases that you guys are involved in. Oh, wow, we really missed that. Um, uh... So uh, do, do, do people feel like uh, they need a further explanation of what uh, Professor Quick Deegan has mentioned that the, uh, that the, uh, uh, the fundamental issue in that one of the problems in the march in request is even if you get a march in request, the government can't actually execute the march in license until the company has exhausted its appeals. But, uh, uh, um, and, and so what, one of the feelings people have is that that would sort of take so much time. In some cases, it would, it would move the purpose. That was a problem that, uh, that uh, Alan Black faced in the Faberzine case, for example. Uh, but what, what you're saying is that that only applies to uh, two of the four marching conditions, but the regulations would apply that to all four. Is that, is that, that's what you're saying? That's my reading of, and this is where it would be good to get some lawyers to go in, but th that's my reading. I'm not a lawyer but I read the statute. If you read the regulations, the regulations are sloppy, but um, the, my reading of the statute mapping to this part of the reg proposed regulation is that's what it would do because it doesn't say anything about sections one and three. It says period. Okay. Uh, okay. And any other further questions on that? Or if not, we'll move on to- I the... think you're going to want to dig in on that. That's all. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely. Um, that, that was really helpful. Uh, okay, the next section is that the, in addition to the regulations which were proposed on the 4th of January and which are available for public comment until the 5th of April, there's a separate legislative package that came out right around Christmas um, that was part of the same process. And this was not to the Bayh-Dole Act, but this was to the Stevenson Wilder Act. And in the, in the webpage, which we shared earlier, there's a link to the actual statutory package, which is probably good for you to pull up and take a look at. There's 10 items which are identified in the, uh, there's 10 items which, which is identified in the uh, legislative package. And we have highlighted some of them for discussion of here, most of them, but not all of them. The first one is uh, a proposal to extend the secrecy 
of CRA, a CRADA is a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, which is an agreement between the US government and either a, the US and another federal agency or the US government and a private entity, it could be a, a university or it could be a for-profit company, uh, to conduct some research and development where both parties contribute something to the overall effort. And uh, uh, Stephen, you would, you would have wanted to speak on this from Public Citizen. Sure. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and I'll first back up a little bit and just say that, you know, for uh, for those in this group that are kind of engaging on the policy making process uh, on these measures, you know, I, I think the regulatory stuff is more urgent um, than these legislative measures. Um, so it, you know, just flagging that off the bat. But on this particular measure, you know, one thing um, I mean, I'll back up too and say, you know, all this and the regulatory measures this is all sourced out of a project that has been undergo, uh, been in, uh, underway at, at Commerce uh, since the early days of the, the Trump administration, um, which, you know, came to, to board, bore out fruit with this green paper that they published, uh, I believe in 2018. And, you know, many of the proposals that we're seeing now in the form of this regulatory package and the legislative package are also, um, in that green paper. Um, but on, on this specific piece, you know, my understanding, and I'm, I'm really, I'm humbled to be in the presence of so many people that have deep expertise in tech transfer here. But my understanding is that this confidentiality pr provision uh, under CRADA is that currently provides five years of confidentiality is specifically with regard to uh, information that was developed by government scientists in government labs under the CRADA and that it's actually that there are separate um, confidentiality protections for information that's developed under the CRADA by the by the private parties that are that are operating under the agreement. Um, and what this proposal does is it extends that five years of protection um, to 12 years. Um, you know, we're concerned about this because uh, because uh, innovation is iterative and getting this information in the public domain will help progress the sciences and advance innovation. Um, the Green Paper sort of justified this policy change by saying that there's a very long time horizon in, the, in developing technologies in the nuclear sector, but I didn't really see much else argument uh, for why this sort of change is needed. Um, so, you know, we think it should be opposed. Um, and you know, to the extent that anything like this is advanced, then it should be based on evidence where there's actually a need um, and not just providing a blanket extension for all sectors of technology where there may or may not be an issue with, you know, with one narrow field. Well, I'll stop there. Catherine, uh, you've looked at this as well. Um, yes, and in practice, this provision has been used by the Army to deny a FOIA request for um, a CRADA, a CRADA be between Gilead and the Army for Remdesivir. So normally under the Freedom of Information Act, if things are not um, obtained from outside of the government, but if they're generated from inside the government, that would not be exempt under Exemption 4 as confidential information or trade secrets. But this statute, even though the information was created by government employees and government labs, would, with, would shield it from inspection by the public. And this is extending that for an additional seven year period, which um, would be really harmful to transparency. You know, from, from, from our point of view, there should be more transparency uh, on a creative front, not less transparency. So we, we're really uh, unhappy to see uh, this proposal. And, 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 and 12 years, <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a long time. Um, five years is a long time. Um, um, any, anyone have any questions on this provision before we go to the next one, which is a, uh, which is probably a little less familiar to people? The next one is the uh, the idea of extending other transactions authority to all federal labs. Um, Catherine, I'd like you to start on this. Sure. So um, other uh, transactions. Go. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, OK, sure. So other transactions authority is an authority that's been given by Congress to 11 federal agencies, starting with NASA and then the Department of Defense, to enter into government contracts that are believed by the agencies to be exempt from laws and regulations that protect taxpayers. 
Um, so we saw this with the COVID-19 contracts. The majority of the contracts were um, other transaction agreements, which are the agreements entered into under this authority, and they weakened or eliminated public interest safeguards under the Bayh-Dole Act. But it's not just the Bayh-Dole Act, it's data regulations that give the government unlimited rights and data if it was a regular contract. It's the Procurement Integrity Act, things designed to protect, um, address conflicts of interest. So everything that has emerged over time as a required regulation in a government contract is treated as optional in another transaction agreement. So what NIST wants to do is... Um, I think, uh, Catherine, you're, you're frozen up here. Yeah, we just lost you, Catherine. It's a moment of suspense. She's... Yeah. <laughs> I will, I will say that uh, while Catherine's getting the bandwidth back, uh, the, uh, the, the other transaction I'm authority, uh, you're back? Okay. Let, let me just finish this sentence and then you can continue. I was just going to explain that because you were, you were frozen up for a while, we couldn't hear you. Um, oh, no. Just for a minute. But, but basically, under the other transaction authority, the government gets to throw out the Bayh-Dole Act and the federal acquisition regulations out the window and just write contracts from scratch and just put whatever they want in the contract. So it's just it started out as a very small loophole in a very small context of things and specialized projects. It's been expanded recently. And uh, the biggest expansion recently was to all these, uh, to the, the bulk of the billions of dollars spent on COVID-19 uh, vaccines and therapeutics. And as well as other uh, COVID-19 technologies. So, uh, uh, and in looking at these contracts, we have found that what's negotiated under the OTA uh, typically radically different than what you get under a standard uh, Bayh-Dole contract and considerably, um, uh, considerably, uh, considerably worse in terms of, the, uh, of the, uh, the rights the US government has. But go ahead, Catherine, I'm sorry to... Uh, Oh, no, you covered that very well. I would just add that right now, federal laboratories typically enter into CRADAs, where, which are also exempt from the bayh Act, but under a CRADA, the government can contribute personnel and equipment, but it cannot contribute funds. So under this new amendment, laboratories for all federal agencies would be able to give funds to the collaborating partner with no strings attached. It's whatever terms the director of the lab thinks is appropriate. I, 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 it was our impression in watching what happened in COVID that uh, the, the companies are going to say, look at how awesome the OTA authority is because we got vaccines, we got them in record time, we're getting therapeutics and stuff like that. So that we thought the industry was going to say, you know, like this should be the new normal that forget about all those public interest provisions in the Bayh-Dole Act because OTA worked better. It was faster. It was less paperwork. And, and so this is sort of the, one of the, the shoes to drop is they're saying, okay, let's actually expand because some of the existing authorities only related to certain countermeasures or COVID-19. This actually just basically really blows uh, uh, the, the door open. And this becomes kind of the new normal, which was agencies can just write up whatever rules they want on uh, government use rights, uh, margin rights, et cetera. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, it's not necessarily faster because instead of just implementing a lot of standard regulations, then the contracting officer has to negotiate everything. Um, and the Moderna contracts, there's two contracts, they are not other transaction agreements. They are standard government contracts. Um, are, go ahead. Sorry. The last point I wanted to make is if HHS had used a standard government contract, the standard regulation for data rights in um, civilian contracts is that the government has unlimited rights in technical data. So, it, so the, this is a uh, this is a a, a, a pretty uh, aggressive uh, uh, proposal in terms of the statutory thing. Does anybody want, have any questions on the OTA issue? Yeah, James. One thing is, I think you want to be a little bit careful here because this is the authority that DARPA has used to do a whole bunch of really useful stuff, uh, and may have even yeah. used this for the original Moderna uh, yeah. RNA stuff. So there are two sides to this. One is the ability to get money to an R&D unit as a funding mechanism, as an alternative to a grant or contract with the usual stipulations. And then there are the, the data. So I think you wanna be careful about this because there are some good aspects of this other transaction authority that, that can at times be quite useful. And I would make sure that you check with the lawyers at DARPA uh, oh, I, as you're thinking about that. 
Yeah, I mean, if they wanted to limit this to the Department of Defense, like it was in the old days, uh, that would be one thing. But they're really expanding it across all kinds of different labs. But let me just mention uh, a couple of things. Like in the in the COVID response, uh, and we t we met with uh, or I met with uh, Operation Warp Speed. One of the requirements for using some of these uh, OTA things, they have to classify some things as prototypes. In some cases, as small businesses and things like that. So they would take a small business entity, they claim something like vaccine development was a prototype project, which is really an abuse of the thing. Or they did a, 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 a company that like, was owned by Pfizer or something that, that, that developed military applications and they claim it was a non-traditional non contractor to the government. And, and, and there's just been a, a, a steady, there's a, a loophole that was designed for certain things like can the Department of Defense contract with somebody that's not a normal defense contractor in some sort of unusual kind of cool way to do some kind of thing that's sort of not a standard deal. And they found ways to, to have the biggest corporations around qualify as small businesses and, and to call like vaccines prototypes and stuff like that. So there's been, there's been a, an experience and a history of abusing whatever wiggle room they have in terms of the authority here, I would have to say. Um, well, we can go, I think, uh, sorry for that constant speeches I'm making here. We can go to the next next issue, is, which is uh, something that Steve has done so, uh, a lot of work on, which is the expansion of agreements for commercializing technology act authority under 15 USC 3710E. Um, Stephen? Sure. Yeah, so the, these agreements are something that's been in place at the Department of Energy for uh, nearly a decade now. Um, initially beginning as a sort of demonstration project, but then uh, then being made permanent uh, just a few years later. But specifically, you know, what these act agreements are, expansion of agreements of commercializing technology authority. Um, so this is with regard to government owned contract operated laboratories um, and allows for you know, similar to other transaction agreements, it these sorts these act agreements circumvent um, traditional public interest protections provided under uh, un, under CRADAs through Stevenson Widler, under Bidol funding agreements, and under standard federal acquisition regulation contracts, um, and allow you know significantly narrow the government interest rights over intellectual property that's um, developed. Um, under the agreement. So specifically, um, under standard agreements, the government, you know, retains a license to use the invention for government use. Um, but the, the, under the act agreements, that license is narrowly limited to uh, using the invention for research purposes. Um, so that's the the long and short of it, the, the NIST proposal is seeking to expand act authority to all departments and agencies that have government owned contractor operated labs. Um, uh, and, you know, we, we are concerned to the extent that doing so would, would replicate these, um, these ways to circumvent um, public interest protections. Questions on this from anyone? That was really, um, that's really something that we're all going to have to dig in and take a look at. Um, we get through, we can talk a little bit about the, the path forward on the legislation. Um, the next topic is the uh, increase on in the cap on royalties to federal employees for inventions from $500,000 to $500,000 per year from $150,000 per year. The current cap and for people that aren't, aren't aware of this, you can be an employee of the NIH or Department of Energy or you know any any federal agency. And if, if you're the inventor on a patent, you're entitled to some share of the royalty income that the federal government gets. They have to share some of it with you. Uh, and if you have like ten inventions, you can get you know money from all, all ten. And there's a lot of people in the federal government that are patent owners, particularly like for example in the NIH, Dr. Fauci is a patent owner. Francis Collins is a patent owner, uh, and there's a lot of senior scientists that, that have a fair amount of patents in their portfolio. We have uh, tried to FOIA 
information from the NIH about how much money is paid to different federal employees. And they've used everything they can over a period of several years to avoid giving us that information. Um, and, and we're recording on it right now and we expect eventually to get that information because we just were kind of curious as to, because uh, we have these problems with the NIH and we are wondering like, well, is part of the problem the fact that the people at the NIH themselves perceive themselves to have an interest in, uh, that's aligned with the drug companies because they're you know benefiting from royalties or something like that. We just we kind of wanted to know what it was. Well, in the past, uh, since around what was it, Catherine? What was the act last amended? Nineteen eighty what? You're, you're muted, Catherine. I think it was nineteen eighty six. Okay, so in nineteen eighty six, it was it was increased from one hundred thousand dollars a year to one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Now they want to raise it to five hundred thousand dollars per year. And uh, uh, there, there's a, a provision, I think it's in the Defense Department, where they can raise it to, to $500,000 a year cumulative, which is even more aggressive than this. Uh, so we just wanted to put that out there that they want to make it. Uh, what, what that tends to do is if you work for the federal government, you, you know, if the price is really high on something, thumbs up, because that's, you're, you're, you're more likely to reach the cap than if the price is low. If the license is exclusive, perhaps you're more interested in reaching the cap. So we think it, it creates a culture within certain agencies. We're not saying that we necessarily oppose the cap being changed, but we, you know, we just sort of follow this issue because we, you know, a lot of times people ask us like, why does the NIH, you know, do do what it does? And 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 people are sometimes surprised that that federal employees get uh, these royalties on top of their salary, and they actually get the royalties after they leave the government as well. Uh, did, did people have any no interest in this? We we can move on to the next issue. That's just I just something we thought people should be aware of. Um, the next one is uh, the creation of nonprofit foundations. Uh, uh, if people are aware of the of the uh, foundation for the NIH or the foundation for the CDC, these are set up by statute. They have some kind of weird status. Because they're they're created by statute, like Francis Collins is a is a member of the board of directors in some capacity for the foundation for the CDC, because he's the head of the NIH. They have private sector people. They have a lot of people from the investment community and drug companies uh, on the board of directors of these things. They get money from the industry, not not just the drug companies. They get money from they solicit money from the video game industry from the liquor industry, from all sorts of different industries that have an interest in what the NIH does. There was a, a bit of a scandal before because the, uh, the foundation for the NIH uh, was soliciting money from the uh, liquor industry to influence the NIH's work on the uh, negative effects of alcohol on public health. And we had a whistleblower that talked to us about, uh, was approached in, in an industry for money to influence a different kind of a, of a of, uh, of an NIH study, which I'm not at liberty to describe what the industry is to protect the whistleblower. But uh, uh, we have now tried to submit a FOIA request to the foundation for the NIH uh, for certain kinds of communications uh, uh, to follow up on this whistleblower complaint, for example. And we were told by the NIH that the foundation for the NIH is not subject to FOIA, that communications between the foundation for the NIH and the NIH are protected because it was considered an interagency communication. But if we FOIA'd the foundation for the NIH, it would be denied because they weren't considered an agency. So for the purpose of shielding information from the foundation to the NIH, it's an agency for purposes of submitting a FOIA to the foundation for the NIH, it's considered not an agency. And uh, uh, the, the CDC has a similar thing, and there's this sort of potential for conflicts of interest. They, they tend to fund pet projects for senior staff at the uh, NIH and things like that. And they may fund or trying to influence certain kinds of studies. Our, uh, uh, they want to extend this, this, this particular program more broadly to, uh, what does it say in here? Uh, it, Steve, you, like to, you want to comment on this, Steve? I know that you've, this is one thing that you've, uh, you've, you've highlighted in your memo. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you summarized it well. Um, the, the proposal um, is to allow for fed all federal laboratories um, to establish nonprofit foundations. Um, 
And, you know, we shared the concerns that Jamie expressed about this threatening the integrity of federally supported research. You know, the, the uh, just to put a slightly finer point on it, the, uh, the alcohol industry funded study, the New York Times ran a piece on this that I'll try and find and share in the chat in just a minute here. But um, in 2017, the New York Times revealed that five of the world's largest alcohol beverage manufacturers had pledged $68 million to the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health to fund a planned 10-year, quote, moderate alcohol and cardiovascular health trial. Um, so you can, the, the conflicts are, are obvious, and this isn't, this isn't a model that we should be replicating. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the World Health Organization itself debating setting up a similar thing, actually have set up a, a foundation for the WHO right now to solicit corporate contributions through. Can you make a comment on that just for some additional context? Sure, uh, it was first announced the idea of creating a WHO foundation by the Director General, uh, Dr. Tedros uh, in 2018. And uh, I believe, um, yeah, the foundation itself, the WHO foundation was set up in 2020 in Switzerland. It is a separate legal entity it's um uh and yes uh, and as jamie described that's why i guess i should have known a bit more about this in a foundation for nih because it almost seems to track uh, a lot of uh uh your concerns um basically they have the mandate to raise money from high net worth individuals and pretty much any uh industry on earth with two exceptions one is the tobacco industry, and the second are arms uh, is the arms industry. But um, it is set up. Uh, they have a new CEO, uh, the former head of uh, Chai, and um, even last week uh, at the executive board of WHO, countries such as the United Kingdom and uh, China, for example, uh, raised concerns about this. And I think among observers uh, and others, I think there really is this concern that, um, you know, since WHO deals with norms and standards, like what are you gonna have, you know, you know, pharmaceutical companies or the like soft drinks manufacturers, the video gamers, the alcohol industry, you know. This is just part, yeah, this is just part of a trend to have, um, you know, I think, I think uh, um, industry to have more influence at, at a deep level of what, public institutions do. Uh, you see this in the, in the enforcement of IP front where there's now a law that says that the people that are the IP attaches around the world, that they are, they're mandated to serve uh, private, private right owner uh, uh, stakeholders and they have to meet with them on a regular basis and kind of report to them what they do. And, uh, um, and, and this is sort of bringing in these companies uh, I mean, they're, they're already, this is already, uh, you know, uh, quite an advanced deal with the NIH and has been some, some time. Maria Ferrer ha ha had gone from being the, uh, the head of technology transfer at the NIH to being the, the head of the foundation for the NIH. I don't know if she still takes that job, but it's a, it's a quite, it's a quite uh, well remunerated position. And she, in, in that position, has now served as an appointee by the US government to a lot of important uh, international health things, including she was uh, appointed to the uh, UN Secretary General expert panel on access to medicine, for example, as representing the United States. We have, I'm just gonna switch, unless people have more questions about this. Uh, and, uh, the next issue is, is just two more on the statutes. One is the broader authority of uh, Department of Commerce and NIST to issue regulations for all federal agencies is re relating to the Stephen Weiler Act. And, and uh, Stephen, you'd flag this. Would you like to uh, speak to this? Um, yeah, if somebody wants to introduce it, I encourage them to do so, I, or else I can, I can do it, though, um, if nobody else wants to. Why don't you go, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, again, I, others will be much more familiar with this than I am, but, you know, under, so by Dole Act, uh, Department of Commerce is, is permitted to establish industry-wide, or excuse me, government regulations that have government-wide applicability, but that is not the case with Stevenson Wildler. Um, this regulatory, or excuse me, this legislative proposal um, seeks to change that to allow commerce to establish government, uh, establish gov uh, regulations with government wide applicability. You know, we are, because of the way that we have seen 
um, commerce seeking to use this authority with regard to buy dole. We are concerned about giving them more authority to, to establish government uh, regulations with government wide applicability. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say about it, I think. Um, you know, for the many of the reasons that we were raising concerns about regulations earlier at the top half of this meeting, we, you know, I, we feel that expanding this to Stevenson Widler would, would uh, invite future opportunities for NIST to give us further reasons to have concerns. Does anybody else uh, follow this issue? Um, have any questions uh, on this topic before we move to our last topic? The last. Uh, the last topic is uh, uh, there's a proposal to uh, uh, give the US government the right to copy software, copyright software, not copy, but copyright <laughs> software, which is uh, 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 right, right now, if a government employee uh, writes software, it's it just, it, it just like anything else that the a US government employee does, you can't copyright it. So if the US government writes a report, like the CRS reports or the VAO reports, if they're done by federal employees, those are, uh, those are in the public domain. There's no copyright on them. And if you do something as a federal employee, copyright, this is an unusual situation. It's not something that applies to state governments. It's not something that applies uh, to foreign countries, generally speaking. But in the US, under our copyright law, works of federal employees are not copyrighted. And that has extended to software. So uh, if the government has a contractor, on the other hand, the contractor can copyright the software. Uh, there is a, a, a provision that the uh, uh, that that would be uh, loosened up a bit here, and that uh, and that there'd be more uh, copyrights on federally uh, uh, federal employees creating software, and that's what this provision is. I haven't really done a deep dive on this issue, but I thought it was important we should find it. Well, I think that's <laughs> we people have been here for an hour and a half. Uh, um, that's what we kind of want. I think that's sort of the, the, the quick overview of the both the Bidol regulations and the Stephen Weiler Act things. I don't really want to force everyone to be on this call for two hours. I know everyone's pretty busy. Um, are there any comments people would like to make uh, before we wrap this thing up to, to reflect on anything that's been said so far or to sort of make some comments about going forward where, uh, where things are at or what, what, what needs to be researched or, or, or looked at? You don't have to, but I, I think this is a good time to do that if people do. Amy, right. I, yeah. if it's okay, I will. Yeah. Um, I think that in terms of what you're trying to achieve and who's going to argue with lower drug prices, <laughs> you'd be surprised. Kind of <laughs> allowed intervention if there's something that's being abused. So I, I just think that 1498 is a more appropriate, I'm not saying do it, but it's it's less likely to interfere with the great US innovation system that has created so many therapies. And, you know, our research has shown that about 300 important therapies have come out of universities and under Baidol. And, you know, the, the whole problem with March in, I, I just think it doesn't work. And, and I think that because it's a timing issue. You, you take a typical example of a university licenses technology to a company, they spend five to 10 years and a lot of money bringing it forward. And only when they go to sell it, would someone be able to say, oh, that is an unreasonable price. And let's, let's try to do a March in. Well, Obviously, we don't agree that that's the correct interpretation of Bidol, but if it were, what good would that really do? If you said, we're going to march in at that point. Well, you know that the company has a lot of know-how, trade secrets, other patents that they will claim would they develop without federal money. And the idea that a march in at that point is actually going to achieve the goal that you're talking about of, low, of forcing a lower price. I don't see that it will. And it also assumes that a competing company will actually 
get a product to market quickly and it will be cheaper. You don't know that. So I, I just think it doesn't, Marchin, for all kinds of reasons, isn't where you should spend your efforts. I, 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 I understand it. Now, in the Xtandi case, which uh, Robert uh, yeah. Sachs presented earlier, uh, $150,000 in the US, 30,000 and 35,000, under 30,000 in some countries. So it's this huge difference between the US price and the foreign price. Prostate cancer, not a rare disease. As you know, it's the top three types of cancer are lung cancer, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. In fact, my oncologist told me that if I live long enough that every single man will get prostate cancer at some point in his life. So it's, it was a little unnerving for me to hear that, but there it was, you know. So it's not, like I say, it's not a rare disease. So then are you saying that, uh, that you should be able to have the US government fund your, fund your R&D and then charge Americans three to five times more than you charge anyone on the planet for a cancer drug? Well, the other companies are not paying their fair share and we're, and we're letting them do that. And that's the problem in, it, in its own right. So we should raise the price in Japan before we address the US price. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, so, so, so Jamie, on this point, I, I actually, I, I tend to agree that the 1498 is just much better suited for most of these situations. I do think that um, marching well, is a statutory well, provision. Robert, let me just ask you on the 1498, because this comes up. 1498 is used by or for the US government. Yeah. And, and so the question I would have between the Marchin and the 1498 is, are there boundaries of foreign by the US government in 1498, which are narrower than you find in Marchin? We'll find that out, won't we? Uh, if, we if, 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 <laughs> if it's actually used. I mean, it hasn't been used since the 1970s um, for well, drugs. I mean, yeah, okay. It's, it's used what? a lot in the Department of Defense, and I, you know, I think we're going to find out because I actually do think 14. It's just that it's much better suited for the post facto kind of situation that you're going to face. I do think, though, that if we've got March in as, as a statutory authority, it, we should get it right. Um, well, so yeah. I think it's worth focusing on the stuff that we're focusing on here. Um, but, and the other thing I was going to say is I think, you know, in, in the case that, uh, that Alan talked about, the case there was not price. The case there was a manufacturer whose price was really high, but there actually was a competitor project. And the main problem was there was a drug shortage. And NIH made a determination that the solution was going to take too long to solve that problem. But the drug shortage lasted for two and a half to three years. And there was a, and there was a, a product in the market in Europe, which was is, is yeah, the Replical was on the market in Europe. So, so, so the, the that situation, it strikes me that you want Marchin to be really quick and efficient, if if you're going to use it, and that's a situation that wasn't price based. And I think so. Marchin, I'm not saying that Marchin is useless. No, I, I think it actually I, I, should be fixed. That's all. That was my my main point. Well, the issue that comes up on 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 1498 versus Marchin, right? I mean, first of all, 1498, you're absolutely right. Uh, the procedures are, are are much superior, and the breadth of what's covered is everything. So that's right. also superior. Right? Right. So the problem that comes up that people address is one: what does does, does forty nine eight count a, uh, cover a case where a private company develops a product, puts it on the market, and sells it through pharmacies, and, and it's reimbursed through private insurance? Does that use by and for the U.S. government? And does it? Re, what sort of uh, engagement does, does the U.S. government have to make to, for someone not to appeal that, the subject to a 1498 case, to say that's not used by and for the U.S. government? Yeah. So, so, so on that point, so, so so the U.S. pays for those drugs through Medicare, Medicaid, S chip, Federal Employees Health Benefits Program, the Indian Health Service, and the Veterans Health Administration, and among yeah. others. So there's a yeah. clear government interest there. So I think 1498 can probably work for that, but we're going to have to test that. Well. Right. Okay. So, so I, I don't, I don't disagree that it would cover. I, I, I don't even disagree that it would cover everything. But I mean, it, it's certainly, it's certainly not an open and shut case. That, yes. that no, you're right. Medicare, because Medicare is not the whole market, and neither is Medicaid. I mean, it's it, it, there's a lot more right. going on in the in the drug market than just that. There, there, there's there's those issues, and also, 
Um, there are other medical technologies uh, like diagnostics and things like that, that maybe have uh, I'll, 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 I'll also cover things like the cases that you worked on, like the Merid uh, case where you're looking at diagnostic tests, right. where not all of them are even reimbursable uh, uh, or, or even used by people necessarily on Medicare. So I think that that what we really should have is a general compulsory licensing authority that is not limited to use by and for the government and not limited to only to government funded inventions as, as, as Fred suggested. And we look forward to Autumn supporting good compulsory licensing legislation in the United oh. States. So, don't so we don't have that. to use the margin rights. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jamie? Who is that? It's Robert. Yeah. Uh, I, I just offer <clears throat> one comment and I, um, which is in the, in the case of Xtandi, and I don't know how common this is, it's not simply the case of a university selling its rights to a biotech as UCLA did with Medivation, which is the name of the company in Northern California, but it's then uh, a secondary sale. A Medivation in turn sells 50%, you know, roughly 50% interest to Astellas, and then later 50% uh, interest to, to Pfizer. And I didn't understand that um, uh, exercise of um, marching rights, you know, would lead to, you know, micromanagement of the price. It would introduce some competition to the price for sure. And the notion of comparing the price to what, what it's available for in every other developed country in the world to, to the US or just pick, pick those um, that have economies that resemble ours more, it, you know, it's not a radical notion. It's something Trump and Biden you know, ostensibly, you know, supported in the campaign. It's something that a Republican-led um, Senate Armed Services Committee several years ago um, uh, advocated, you know, told DOD they should be looking at. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, everybody from Pete Buttigieg to Bernie Sanders, uh, which kind of runs a spectrum, have, have supported. Um, Surely, um, you know, there's a way that uh, marching rights can be exercised that um, don't create the, the nightmare scenario that Fred seemed to suggest for universities. Also, also, just one of the, one of the arguments against marching was like sort of this idea of like, well, who knows what a reasonable price is? You know, it's like sort of this this unicorn out there or something like that. So then. Uh, some of the proposals that were part of the defense uh, uh, authorization act a few years back were that an international reference pricing would be a ceiling of what's considered a reasonable price if the government had rights in the patent. So that idea was that if the taxpayers help funded the invention, charge whatever you want, just don't charge more in America than you charge for everyone else because we paid for the R&D or some of the R&D. So that's, that's actually a very easy thing for a company to understand because uh, 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 they're the ones setting the prices and they're the ones setting the prices in the other countries. The other thing I wanted to mention to Robert in the Xandy case is that what Medivision sold to Astellas was not 50%. They sold 50% of the US market, but more than 50% of the non-US market. And so Medivision hung on to like a royalty on the non-US sales from Estella, but Estella got the lion's share of the non-US sales on uh, Xandy. Uh, but the U.S. Uh, so what Pfizer bought was half of the U.S. market for 14 billion, and uh, and, and a royalty on the foreign um, the foreign sales. Uh, and actually, Xandy would be worth more, except that the its competitor drug in the prostate cancer fail thing lost its patent status and became a generic, and it's pretty cheap. And so some of the insurance companies force you to take the other product instead of Xandy, just because it's a lot cheaper. So one of the kind of hidden things you have in excessive prices is the doctor doesn't make necessarily the best medical decision for the patient, but they make the decision 
which they can sort of get away with because of the radical differences in prices between a product that's off patent and a product that's on patent. And, uh, and uh, that's a harder thing to measure, uh, I, I, I think. Anyway, uh, I, I think we can wind this up, this call up though, uh, unless people, yes, Alan and, 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 and Bob. First, first Alan and then Bob. Hi, just a quick comment, the, or at least particularly, or at least on the regulations. Um, Department of Commerce uh, delegated, if you will, uh, NIST to promulgate these regulations. And it strikes me that at least the regulations we've talked about are highly interpretive of legislative intent. And they're not something National Institute of uh, Standards and Technology would even have much knowledge of. You know, if they were setting atomic clocks, sure. But instead, they're talking about uh, regulations that involve drugs, which they wouldn't have any particular technical expertise in. So Department of Commerce has done this before. Uh, the Patent Act was, quote, regulated by the U.S. Patent Office, and they had very, uh, you know, pro-corporate sections in it, and it was challenged by an inventor as just simply being not authorized uh, under separation of powers. And so all of these regulations appear to be way beyond what, uh, you know, a, an administrative agency, particularly a, a NIST would be able to even understand. So I, I think these regulations are susceptible to challenge just on the fact that they're not an, an agency that would be authorized to either be delegated the, uh, you know, the authority to do it, or these are so substantive in interpretation, the courts are going to get pissed off um, that NIST is setting uh, some of these standards for like, what's a reasonable term for a patent. So we, just something to think about. We, 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 we've highlighted the, uh, a handful of issues in the Bible regulations that, the, 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 you know, we thought were bad ideas. Not everything in, in the NIST proposals uh, was, is probably um, something that you would oppose. I mean, some, some of the requirements you'd probably welcome. But I, I understand what you're saying is that, is that NIST itself is sort of, uh, you know, removed from the subject matter that's impacted by a lot of the regulations. And certainly the pricing thing is really coming out of the debate on the drug side. It's not coming out of the debate on the bicycle or the, you know, the, the, the defense side. Um, of the energy side. Bob, you had a, a comment. You had your hand. No, I, this is just a kind of maybe a place to leave it because you don't want to get into it today. But I also thought another thing that you might want to have a conversation about is the proposed um, statutory redefinition of patentable subject matter that uh, Senators Coons and Tillis are proposing. And now we know they aren't going to turn to that until at least April. But um, I think that's something that I'm, I know you guys are on, but it sounds like some of the same constituencies would also be interested in that. Yeah, the one-on-one -on -one conversation, yeah, or, or one-on-one, et cetera, I guess is a better way to put it, yeah. Jamie, uh, can, I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah, Steve, yeah. Thanks. Um, I, you know, I just don't want to, again, referring back to what I mentioned earlier, like I think I am I am somewhat worried about this regulatory proposal moving forward. You know, NIST is sort of, I don't get the sense that it it is, uh, you know that its its aims shift as much with the change of administration as we might hope, um, and especially considering, you know, we have somebody coming in to head commerce who has a background in healthcare venture capital. I I don't think that uh, that you know we can assume that because Biden is president now that that these regulations aren't going anywhere. So I would. Um, you know, Jamie and company, I, I think, shared the Federal Register notice in the chat. I would really encourage folks to um, who have capacity to uh, to weigh in on those. Um, and, and again, just to reiterate, I am um, more concerned about that than the legislative piece. I'll be, although I also shared in the chat, you know, a lot of this has been introduced as legislation before, which I, you know, I, I missed when it was introduced about a year ago. Um, 
but it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of support, at least judging from the list of co-sponsors right now. Well, based on what Steven said, I, I talked to someone uh, on the transition uh, team that is considered an expert on these Bayh-Dole acts. And I thought this person would be kind of, uh, uh, kind of like in tune with us on, oh yeah, I have to stop this sort of thing. And that's horrible. And, and the reaction was the opposite. Your reaction was like, oh, I thought these things were, you know, well thought out and, you know, on the right track. And so I, I think, uh, uh, I think the odds of Biden stopping this is way less than 100 percent. You know, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, assume anything. I, I, I think this really is something that's going to require a fair amount of work to to engage on. Nina, did, did you have your hand up on anything? I, 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 you sort of <laughs> I, do you have any comments? You, you've you been very silent and you're this is a, a, an area of deep expertise for you. I have been absorbing all this. It's all uh, very interesting. So. Thanks. Jamie, if I could just make one one comment. It's Lisa Vertinsky. Um, I have a question in terms of how do you, what would you like to see the academic community or at least me <laughs> doing um, to, because I, I agree with you that I, I think that if you look at what's happening in the public private partnerships, I mean, there's a big trend towards privatization of um, of the R&D, at least from my perspective. And so apart from responding to notes and comments, are there things you would, you think would be effective or maybe that this is for a, a different call? Well, I, I mean, I, I think we, this shouldn't be the last call on these issues, but I think that you're right. I mean, there, 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 there is a, a debate that should be had on how much secrecy and how much, uh, and how much openness there should be on federally funded research. I think the, the notion that somehow more secrecy and more pri privatization of, 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 of R&D is, is an issue where it, it's obviously like where you put the needle. I mean, I, I think a lot of people accept that there should be some measure of the confidential and some measure of proprietary rights. And it, it's just a question where the balance is. I, I, our, our view right now is, 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 is there needs to be a reset in one direction, but I think right now the lobbying by the industry is, is on the opposite side. Just, and these, these proposals kind of reflect that. Um, um, uh, you have a secretary of HHS coming in that probably open to the idea that there should be more, uh, you know, more in line with what we're saying. But as, as Stephen mentioned, there's other people in the administration that might 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 look the other way. The new general acting general counsel for uh, for uh, Congress is someone that knows something about these issues. It's uh, it's a uh, 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 Quentin Palfrey who uh, was a candidate for lieutenant governor, I think, in Massachusetts, and he he was a former he used to work in the general counsel's office before uh, for commerce under, under Obama. And uh, uh, he's a person I think is a smart guy. He's, he's worked with industry in the, in the past as well. He's sort of an eclectic background. Um, but I imagine that he's, uh, he worked with Terry Fisher at Harvard at the, um, at the Berkman Center. Um, and uh, I would encourage people to uh, communicate with uh, Quentin on these issues as well. Maybe Fr Fred, you probably know who's in charge of all this stuff. We don't really know <laughs> everybody. <laughs> uh, we're just waiting for, to figure out who's running the government. We assume that Nina, uh, Nira rather, and, and, and her uh, and Topher, these guys that come over from CAF, we, we, this seems to be an area where they might fall. But my guess is with the administration, at the end of the day, it'll be the White House that probably will be decisive on these issues. And it's hard to tell you know, which way they would go. 